We are in Greenville, South Carolina in the Japanese theme garden of Bob Smith. Bob, when you came here, this was, I think, one of those yards that gets yard of the month for overall neatness and tidiness because it was nothing but turf grass and some trees. No, it was a blank canvas is what it was. And is that what you wanted? That's what I wanted so I could create my own type of uh, garden, which I've done. Greenville and the upstate is notorious for infertile, well not infertile, but hard to deal with, clay soil. Did you feel like you needed to transform your soil? I brought in about 20 truckloads full of soil, topsoil and river sand, and mixed that together and formed berms around the entire yard, which I used for plantings for the larger trees and such, which gives us total privacy. And one of the ways that you've also created privacy here is through your use of sound, mm -hmm. natural sounds that you've um, where you allow nature to um, provide music for you. Let's talk about how that operates. Sure. Of course, the number one thing for me is the waterfalls I have surrounding me. And then, uh, two, we have a lot of large chimes throughout the yard to take advantage of the wind. And I even had a 2,000-year-old a concept called a Mohican wind harp, which, uh, when the wind goes, prevailing wind goes through uh, strands of nylon, it creates a very low harmonious sound going through the yard. Kind of an mmm. Exactly. It kind of exactly. sets you in a meditative mood. It does. After you've been working all day and need to cool off. And sleep. So I <laughs> always go down. Now my, my wife calls it a hermit shed, but I call it my tea house. So I go down there. And I imagine if you're down there and she needs you to um, take care of an, a very important honeydew, she can um, actually take that little mallet and strike that bell? Actually, no, my hearing gets very poor when I get down <laughs> in the tea house. <laughs> <laughs> but let's do talk about that beautiful bell. Okay, thank you. The bell was originated back in 140 years ago, about 30 miles uh, south of uh, Beijing, China. And it was in, at the front of a monastery. And uh, then a lot of times these older artifacts will be taken to market to be sold. And I had a friend of mine in town who had a business who would go to China twice a year and shop for those types of things. So everything I have in my yard is at least 100 years old. It's usually hand carved granite or stone or like this uh, bronze bell, which I have, and uh, we've had it now for about a year here in the yard. But we came up here today because um, we didn't know about the beauty of the landscape. We came particularly to talk about the koi ponds. Koi ponds. But, and you said that actually it wasn't so much the fish, but the water associated with it that all brought it together. So let's exactly. talk about this first beautiful koi pond. Sure. Well, if you study a Japanese garden, you know it's got to have a koi pond in it, right? So uh, I started with the waterfall concept, and then I just had to decide how big I wanted the koi pond to be, which is measured in gallons of water. The one behind us is 3,500 gallons. And right now, unfortunately, it has too many koi because of the reproductive habits. So uh, I'm gonna be giving some of those away to the Clemson University uh, for- Dr. Beecher, Dr. I believe. Beecher. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so he's coming in next week and I'm gonna give him a lot of koi from my lower pond, which is twice the size of this one. And also, hopefully, he'll take some of my goldfish, which are getting pretty big also. So, so they're small when you get them, but they uh, grow very quickly. Oh, they do. Uh, I get to, we're about 20 pounds and uh, 28 inches on some of the koi down here in three years. And they started like that. There's a technique that you need to use when you're establishing a koi pond. So let's quickly explain to our viewers how you go about that. What you do, basically, is decide what shape you want your koi pond to be, how large it needs to be. And then you want to plan the uh, specific uh, like waterfall steps coming into your pond. This one only has two. That one has five because it's about a 60 foot long waterfall stream. Uh, so, but what that does, it creates a lot of aeration in the pond. So you want that. You also need aeration if you have a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. So that's important. So I have five aeration devices in the lower pond and three in this one for that purpose. And I've really enjoyed seeing the different types of stone within the pond, mm -hmm. the stones around, mm -hmm. and then on top, they seem to be more angular. So is there a reason for that? The reason is, is you have uh, koi when they are uh, spawning, uh -huh. is the, they have, the female koi are bigger than the male koi. They move around slower. But what they do is they'll move around the edge of the pond and you'll see them get chased by two or three male koi mm -hmm. around the edge of the pond and then they'll hit the female on the side like this. You can hear them uh -huh. slap them. And that causes the egg to be released and then the males fertilize it. Uh -huh. And so it comes out in a very sticky ribbon and it attaches itself to the walls of the, of the pond. Now these walls are made from river rock, which is rounded, oh. worn down by water. 
and that prevents the female from getting hurt against angular rocks. So if she's pushed against she's pushed the wall, against the rock like she that. won't be injured. She won't be hurt. But then above that, you have a different type of I have of a, a Tennessee field stone, uh -huh. and it's uh, you know flatter and sharper and easier to stack. Uh -huh. And as we look up here on the upper pond, there is um, a looks like it's a somewhat precariously balanced structure mm -hmm. of stone. And you said That's that has an interesting story. Yeah, the Karen was originated in, in China, went to Japan, and then came to Ireland and Scotland. This is like 2,000 years ago. And why did they, you said they were They were uh, markers? trail markers mm -hmm. and also signs of good luck. Okay. So I have a Karen here. I also have one down here in my uh, sand area. My, uh, and, uh, so again, I want to create as much luck as possible. You have a good bit of bamboo here, mm -hmm. and you said um, you do keep after it. You have to. Even though these are theoretically non-evasive bamboos, I have black and I have a yellow, they are invasive. So you have to keep your eye on them because within a few days, you can see strands growing from here to 15 feet away, and they'll grow up. 30 feet high and within six weeks so you got to be careful with them. And the black bamboo though is very beautiful and you use that I think um, although from a commercial source mm -hmm. in the creation of your lovely little tea house. I did. I, I purchased it from a group in California and um, I picked black bamboo because I like that color and then we stain it uh, a similar color and it's stranded together with steel wire so it comes in rolls so it's easy. I just have to cut it which is not easy to do because it's so hard but you cut it the size you need and then put it up as a wall. And then as we look around, um, you are in such, have so much privacy, although you're in the middle of a subdivision, right. and you've used many Asian seeming plants, um, particularly the conifers, I think, and mm -hmm. the Japanese maples. So mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little about the conifers first, because sure. some of them have such variety of color. These are all different shades of green and pretty hardy, so that's why I like them. And then, of course, since we do have an Asian theme, the Japanese maples are so beautiful. Yeah, I enjoy it. That's my favorite tree. As the one is beside you, it stays uh, burgundy all summer. And it's, uh, it's an old one. It's probably about 12, 15 years old. And I purchased it when it was uh, not too much smaller than this, but I have probably 25 different Japanese maples throughout the yard that grow pretty aggressively here. And then um, I just can't imagine how many rocks you have picked up and moved, <laughs> but there is also a dry stream bed mm -hmm. because you do have a fair, fairly steep um, slope here. Right. And that area down there could have been just a morass. It was, uh, it was much like a bog uh, when I first got here, right through that section where you see the faux riverbed. So I put in, uh, I dug a slight hole, a ditch that's about 100, 15 feet long into a drain that then goes under my burn and then goes on out with the national regular topography. And so uh, then you put in a uh, weed block, a uh, rubber liner, and then stone, and it, water flows down that slowly, filters out, and it'll also feed your yard, but it won't sit there, it'll keep moving. Bob, this has been like a trip to Asia for me. Um, I love history and to understand the reasons behind architecture and why certain things are done in different ways, how to interpret it, and its connection with the past has been fascinating. Um, I wondered if we could almost consider this, um, it certainly for me has been an education and maybe we can signal the end of class by going down and striking that 150 year old bell. That'd be fun. Okay. Bob Smith, thank you for sharing this beautiful creation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.